Okay, that's the meeting now recording. So I will now take the sedent of the Risk and Audit Scrutiny Committee on the 17th of November 2021. Um, I can see that we have Councillor Brogan present. We also have Councillor Donnelly. We have Councillor Ferguson present and Councillor um, Holford. Councillor Lennon? No. Nope. And I can see that we have Councillor Mars present. Councillor McLachlan? No, nope. I can see that we have Councillor Nugent present and we also have Councillor Wart present. Also present today is Councillor Ross. We have a number of officers in, in attendance, uh, Cleland Sneddon, Paul Manning, Jackie Taylor, Yvonne Douglas, Tom Little, uh, myself, Elizabeth Ann McGonigal and Angela Norris from Administration Services. We also have um, colleagues from Audit Scotland, Fiona Mitchell-Knight, Andrew Kerr and Gemma McNally. So with that, I'll pass you back to the Chair to uh, commence today's business. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So with that, let's move on to item one, declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest, please? No. Good. So, item two, minutes of the previous meeting. Do we have any um, items to raise from the minutes of the previous meeting? Nope. Okay, in that case, I move them as a correct record. Can I have a seconder, please? I'll second, Eric. Thank you, Mary. And... Uh, We'll move on to item three, which is the External Auditors Report 2021. And we have Fiona Mitchell-Knight from Audit Scotland, I believe, is going to open on this. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be with you today to present our findings from the 2021 audit, um, which will enable you to move on to uh, approving the accounts. Um, in terms of, of the package before you, um, at page uh, 13 of your papers, there is a covering letter that describes how we've completed the audit work for the year. Um, it includes our audit opinion from page 15. I'm very pleased to report that all our audit opinions on the accounts are what we call unmodified or unqualified. So that means that we feel that the accounts represent a true and fair view of the council's financial position at the year end, at the end of 31st of March 2021, and of the year's activities. There have been some changes to the accounts from the unaudited version that was first considered, and, and these have all been reflected following the audit findings. So we're very comfortable with the accounts that you see before you um, to approve later on today. We'll talk about um, some of the findings of the annual audit um, on the accounts in, in a minute. In addition to the audit opinion, at page 19 is just a copy of the letter of representation that the Section 95 officer will provide to us as part of the basket of audit evidence to allow us to conclude our, our audit. And there's nothing unusual in that or for you to be concerned about. Also attached to the covering letter are similar audit opinions and letters relating to some of the trusts. Um, that the council administers that we're also required to audit. So that's very good news for you in, in terms of the accounts. And I would like to pay credit to Paul Manning and Jackie Taylor and the finance team for being able to produce the accounts um, that, that have attracted this unmodified op opinion in such difficult circumstances. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Andrew Kerr, who's going to talk you through the detail of our annual audit report, which is in page 31 onwards of the papers. Um, and we'll both be happy to answer questions um, at the end of that presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Fiona, and good morning, everyone. As Fiona mentioned, our annual report starts on page 31 of your committee papers. So this report, brings together all of the audit work that we've undertaken in the financial year 2021. I don't intend to go through the full report in detail, but I would like to highlight the following within it. So the key messages 
are on pages 33 and 34 of the papers. And these give a brief overview of the results of our work. The main points in relation to the annual accounts are at numbers one to three. And as mentioned by Fiona at points one and two, here you'll see our audit opinion again reflected, noting that this is unqualified or unmodified. I'll cover point three in a bit more detail later on. As you'd expect, our report and the key messages from this have a focus on COVID-19, given the, the ongoing impact this has had during the year. Whilst the, the messages recognise the challenges to the Council of the pandemic, it's worth acknowledging this in the, the wider context of the public sector as a whole, with these challenges not exclusive to the Council. You know, whilst noting the additional financial pressures um, as a result of the pandemic, we do report in the key messages that the Council has effective financial management arrangements in place, both to monitor and respond to these. In addition to ongoing effective financial management, another key area of our audit focus during this pandemic is to ensure that good governance has been maintained. And in key messages 10 through to 12, we have commented positively on how the Council responded to the pandemic to ensure that good governance arrangements were maintained throughout. And in the body of the report, members will see we've also highlighted a couple areas of good practice just regarding the Council's response. Members will be aware that the Council was subject to a best value audit that was published in March of 2019. There were a number of recommendations raised as part of this review, and the work this year has again followed up on these. And at key message number 13, we note that the Council has made good progress with the recommendations. We will continue to monitor its progress against these as part of our work on next year's audit. Overall, I think it's fair to say that the, the key messages reflect positively on the Council whilst recognising the ongoing challenges that COVID-19 has brought to it. I'd now like to touch on and bring to members' attention the significant findings from our audit of the annual accounts. So these start on page 40 of the papers at Exhibit 3. Again, I don't intend to go through all of these, However, it's worth noting that where required, management have agreed to make the necessary adjustments to the accounts for these points. Following on from key message number three, I would do like to highlight points two and three in the exhibit. These relate to issues we identified with the accounting for certain non-current asset items. Members may recall that in previous annual reports, we have identified similar issues with this account area. And based on our previous experience, together with the issues noted this year, we have raised a couple of recommendations which management have agreed to action. And we welcome management's strong response to these recommendations. As part of our work on next year's audit, we will be reviewing the Council's progress against them. So we do recognise the, the key role that the Council has played in supporting individuals, families and businesses th through the, the financial burden of the pandemic. You know, this required a significant amount of auditor resource to help facilitate payments to those um, um, eligible for help. From an accounting perspective, this brought with it its own challenges and uh, issue five of Exhibit 3, we note the various changes required to the accounts due to updated, um, often late guidance that was being received on the accounting treatment for specific funding streams, which then required the Council to respond to accordingly and make the necessary adjustments to the annual accounts. So Exhibit 3 covers the main findings from an audit of the annual accounts, and they've also covered some of the key messages from our work on the, the wider dimensions. Our work in each of these areas can be found in sections two to five of the report. Rather than go through these sections in detail, I'd now like to go to page 75 of the papers, which is appendix one of our annual report. 
This is our list of actions from the 2021 audit. I've already covered points one and two that relate to the, the accounting for non-current assets. Point three relates to medium and longer term financial plans. So just reflecting back on our key messages, specifically key message number nine, we highlighted that, that given the, the impact the pandemic has had on all public sector finances, it's recommended that the council revises its financial plans accordingly to take into account the impact um, of this on, on its finances. We will be following up on all three points raised in the action plan as part of our audit next year. Appendix one also notes the council's progress on our prior year recommendations, and we consider that good progress has been made in most of these areas. Finally, I'd just like to reiterate our thanks to all the council officers involved in the annual accounts process. Despite the difficulties presented by the pandemic, the unaudited accounts and the corresponding working papers were presented to the audit team on time, and these were of a high standard. This made the completion of our audit work much more straightforward, and it will allow us to sign off the annual accounts in line with the revised timetable, which is a great achievement given the circumstances. That's it from me, Chair. Um, Fiona and I would be happy to take any questions that the committee may have on our report. Okay, thank you very much both. That was that was great. Um, and congratulations to Paul and Jackie and their team for um, producing this information too. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very good to read this report. Now, do we have any questions, please? Uh, no hands, Chair. Nobody. Nobody wants to ask any questions. Well, that must reflect on the fact that the, um, the the accounts were presented in such a clean way. So, uh, thank you to Fiona and Andrew. Um, I just need the report to be noted. So, I, I'll move that it's noted and I'll need a seconder, please. I'll second that. Okay. Thank you again, Mary. And if we agree the report. Thank you. Um, We'll move on to item four, the um, audited annual accounts. And Paul is going to speak to this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so obviously the, the members have now heard Audit Scotland's report. So we, we come on to the report, which is on the annual accounts themselves. And that's for both the council and for the charitable trusts. So at 3.3, it picks up straight off from the paper that you just heard from Audit Scotland. And then at 3.4, it says that copies of the audited accounts for both the council and related charities have been able to members of the committee. Uh, and they'll be issued to all elected members for information. So the points made there at 3.4, because they aren't signed yet, and that will happen after uh, you take the action that you're required to under recommendations at this committee. And as, as it says there, once that's happened and they've been signed, they'll be available to the public on the council's website. And obviously we can make other arrangements there that are covered at 3.5 for folk who can't get an emailed version. So what is covered there at, at sections four and section five are, first of all, the council's accounts and then the accounts for the charitable trusts. Now, in essence, What's happening there is it's repeating back to you the information that you heard as part of the auditor's report, and it's making the point that we've updated the accounts uh, as Andrew described within the paper. So things that we've talked about with Audit Scotland, the actions that we've had to take in respect to those documents are reflected in those versions. So what I'll do just before I, I take you through the recommendations is just to, to, to thank on behalf of my own staff a Audit Scotland for their cooperation because it isn't easy for them to do this in the way that they've had to work over the past year as well. And as ever, they've been really professional uh, and helped us through this exercise greatly. So thanks to Audit Scotland. But in terms of the recommendations at 2.1, looking for noting that the council's accounts and the charitable accounts have received a clean audit certificate, uh, asking that they be approved for signature Noting that the external auditor's report will be referred to the council for information and that it be noted that the accounts in their audited form will be available on the council's website. So thanks, Chair, and happy to take any questions. 
Thank you very much, Paul. And have we any questions? Uh, no hands, Chair. Nobody at all. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul, um, for your report. May I uh, move that we approve this report? And can I have a seconder, please? I'll second, Eric. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and if we're all agreed, we can move on to item number five, which is the internal audit plan for the six months to 31st of March 2021. And Yvonne Douglas is going to speak to this. I think we've got a raised hand. Do we want to take that oh, just before I sorry. start agenda item five? Sorry, John, I didn't see your hand there. That's okay, Eric. Uh, thanks very much. Um, it was really just to make a comment. Uh, I think uh, we only need, we're only required here uh, for items three and four. Uh, uh, and if that's uh, fine, then I'll be looking for your permission, if possible, to leave the meeting. Uh, but before I do that, I'd just like to thank you uh, for the cordial welcome, as usual, to this committee. I thoroughly enjoyed turning up for the couple of items that I'm required to do so. Uh, but before I go, I would like to thank uh, Audit Scotland for the very diligent way that they normally go about this and for the, uh, again, a good report for South Lanarkshire uh, and also to Paul and his team uh, for the very competent way they go about presenting things uh, as usual. So uh, with those few comments, uh, Eric, uh, thanks very much for taking the time uh, to invite us along today. Okay. Thank you, John and Cleland. Uh, Elizabeth Ann had written a note in red to remind me that you were leaving after item four, and I completely ignored it. So That's I'm okay. sorry. But thank Thanks thank you very, very much, much for coming back. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Okay, and with that, I think we move on to Yvonne. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the purpose of our agenda item five, which runs pages ninety one through to one hundred and one is to seek approval for the second phase of the 21-22 internal audit plan. So this is for the six months that will take us through to the 31st of March next year. Uh, the committee will remember that they've already seen the first of the six-month plans um, that ran through to 30 September. That was approved back in March. Um, and appended to this report is a, a brief summary as to the progress that has been made um, with this plan. And that, as I say, is set out at Appendix 1. Separately, Appendix 2, what is then set out is the proposed programme of work that takes us through from the 1st of October through to the 31st of March. And I appreciate this is running a wee bit late, um, but we have had some um, additional work in the first six months that we didn't anticipate that has impacted on progress, but that's been detailed in Appendix 1 for the committee's information. And the last appendix to this report, Appendix 3, um, notes all of the assignments that have been completed. Now, that's over the first six-month plan and the second six-month plan and links them to each of the key assurance areas. So that tells you whether it will inform our opinion on governance, risk management or internal controls. And that's important because the final report that will come from us, an annual report, produces an annual report, uh, an annual opinion across those three areas. And what Appendix 3 is doing is setting out how each of the assignments will inform the audit opinion. Um, there's an intention to uh, review the second phase of the audit plan and this will be brought to the committee in January 2022 with a, a final update in relation to progress. As I said, Appendix 2 sets out the plan itself um, and as usual what we've tried to do is um, provide some additional information. So we've noted where um, we um, know what the lead resource is at this stage, where we don't know it will be noted as all. Um, we've also set out a brief outline scope for the assignment, but that is subject to change once we um, discuss the detail of the assignment with council services, um, agree what the risks are and what the controls are that we intend to test. Now, you'll, you'll be aware that I referenced the public sector internal audit standards in these reports, so there's a requirement within those standards for us to link to the council's top risks. Um, and paragraph 4.3 is noting that these were reassessed in 21-22, but this didn't result in any significant changes. So we're not suggesting that there needs to be any further changes to either the, the proposed plan or the plan of work that we're bringing to a conclusion for the first six-month period. 
And because of the timing of this, we're actually commencing work on the 22-23 plan. So the same process as in previous years. We'll discuss that with um, council resources and with the external audit. But at this point, I'm also asking the committee to consider if there's any items that they think should be included in the audit plan for next year. Um, you'll also be aware that over the last couple of years, you've seen the plans presented to you in separate six-month intervals. Um, we may or may not continue with that. Um, what we intend to do is have a look at how other local authorities are approaching their internal audit work. There are some benefits in six-month plans because they do allow a level of flexibility, um, but also some challenges in terms of producing a cohesive plan of work across the full year. So we're going to have a look at what other local authorities are doing, and we're also going to have a look at what best practice guidance is in this area as well. Um, and the outcome of that exercise will be reported to the committee in January 2022. And that will be either that we continue to present six monthly plans or we revert to the, the annual audit plan has been um, the previous practice prior to the start of the pandemic. So in terms of this plan, um, I'm asking that the committee approve this um, to allow us to commence work on this through to 31st March 2022. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Yvonne. And have we any questions? Not seeing any raised hands. No hands raised. Oh, you're getting an easy ride again. Um, uh, in that case, can I propose that we approve this uh, paper and can I have a seconder, please? I'll second it this time, Eric. Oh, thank you very much. And um, if we approve that, then we can move on to item number six, internal audit activity as at 29th of October, and Yvonne again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this runs pages 103 through to 109, um, and provides the committee with some information on the progress and the performance of internal audit in the period 28th of August through to the 29th of October. Appendix 1 sets out the usual performance information. Um, if you um, quickly have a look at that, you'll note that targets have been met, albeit there is a note around the progress of the plan, um, but trying to give the committee some assurance of, as to how this will be managed through to the 31st of March. Um, and that is an intention to, to meet the target of delivering the draft plan by the end of the financial year. In terms of audit output in the period, again, that's attached to Appendix 2 in a summary form. Um, ten separate reports that were issued in the period, three for South Lancashire Council and seven for our external clients. Um, only one um, significant um, piece of work that was concluded, and that was looking at emerging risks um, throughout COVID, particularly in relation to fraud risks. Um, just before I take the committee through this, I'll just draw your attention to paragraph 5.2. Um, you'll maybe remember that we committed to have a look at how we produced this report um, and how we presented these findings to the committee to try and support scrutiny going forward. So a couple of small changes that have been made to this. Uh, firstly, you'll note that it's a more expanded key messages summary. So we would be in um, the habit previously of having a single page summary. We've tried to expand it to give members further information. And also what I've done is, is taken the opportunity at the bottom of the key messages summary to, to just note some questions that when you read through that summary, these are the questions that you should be able to satisfy yourself. And if you're not able to satisfy yourself, these are perhaps areas that you would want to um, think about in terms of um, scrutiny to try and gather some more information to provide yourself with those assurances. So if I can just now quickly move into Appendix C just to take you through that. So as I said, this was an Audit Scotland report that was produced in um, July of last year um, that was recognising that fraud risks had um, changed, um, possibly heightened during the pandemic, um, and had noted some key areas for, for public sector bodies to consider. So as is normal practice, we have a look at these Audit Scotland reports and we see how they apply to South Lancashire Council. So the Audit Scotland report was noting that within any crisis situation, there is inherently high risk of fraud, and that's because new processes are being designed and implemented, and also because business as usual controls are sometimes weakened or suspended on occasions. In the third paragraph down um, in the background, they're noting that the areas of main fraud risks, so they're saying that these are the fraud risks that they think were heightened during the, the pandemic um, in respect of uh, public sector bodies. I think an important point to note is they're not new fraud risks, they all did exist pre-COVID, but they are noting that the risk could potentially have heightened. 
So the report and the key messages page then goes on to say out um, the council's awareness of those heightened risks um, of our vulnerabilities and also the acceptance, acknowledgement and action around additional controls that needed to be put in place to mitigate those risks. Um, and that's including ensuring that employees understand the fraud risks and the anti-fraud controls that they need to put in place to mitigate. Um, it was important, um, and in fact, it was the case that our fraud reporting channels remained open throughout the pandemic. So all intelligence that was reported to us was investigated in the same way that it would ever have been. Um, and we have the same zero tolerance policy and that if fraud is proven, we will pursue um, recovery of any money lost by the council in relation to fraud. Um, the reason why it's important to, to mitigate these fraud risks is because there can be financial implications for the council, there can be reputational damage, and ultimately there can be an impact on either service delivery or service users. So in terms of the key observations, this is us applying all of these lessons to South Lancashire Council. So we're noting there that the fraud risks have heightened across key financial business processes. And now it then goes on to set out within the key messages what our action has been in relation to that. So the intention is in 21-22 to do some further analysis around spend with suppliers and to look at contracts that were awarded during the pandemic. Uh, we'll undertake some sample testing, um, albeit we have already obtained assurances from resources that controls remain robust throughout the period. We're also going to have a look at business grants, which, which fall into that uh, category of crisis payments and the particular fraud risks around that. Um, given both the volume and value of the grants that were dispersed in a very short period of time. Uh, in 21-22, we're going to rely quite heavily on the NFI output, um, but you might see further work coming through in um, new um, audit plans for 22-23, um, doing some further testing in that area. Um, in terms of the remote working, uh, the report's noting that obviously produced some other risk for us, the risk of loss or theft of council assets, um, quite a lot of work has been ongoing to change how we record our inventory, how we monitor it um, and how we track the location of that. Um, we're also having a look at our stock control arrangements um, and our employees have had a lot of reminders over the period to remind them of duties to safeguard assets and council data, but also to reiterate the potential sanctions around the misuse of data um, as, a, as a deterrent um, to anybody. Um, they've also been given some support around scams that they may be exposed to during the pandemic, the good practice steps that they should follow. Um, and we have been provided with the Council's IT security team and monitoring this, the cyber security threats and have introduced additional controls to uh, maintain the security in the face of cyber threats, as well as the potential security implication that arising from remote connections. That's the kind of main points. And as I said, at the very bottom of that, it then leads on to those three questions that when you read the key messages summary, these are three key areas of assurance that you should have as a committee. Um, and this is a practice that we're going to continue moving forward as to present key messages to the committee um, so that it can support the scrutiny. In terms of the other points within the, the, the monitoring report, um, just really um, assurance around there are no significant team or employee issues that I need to report to you. And in terms of our financial position, we're reporting a break-even position at the end of the financial year. So that concludes that report. And in terms of the recommendation at 2.1, I'm asking that you know our progress and our performance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Yvonne. That was very well covered, actually. Um, now, do we have any questions? I see a hand raised. Jared. Jared Walk. Hello. Um, Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, it was just, thanks, Jared. It was just to ask um, at the end of Appendix 3 on uh, 109, like you said, uh, uh, those highlighted questions. Um, and the first one, says our members satisfied that, uh, that the report captures all of the key emerging fraud risks. Um, so it was just to ask, is are all the sort of uh, COVID fraud risks highlighted within the key messages or is it really just the main the main uh, risks that have been highlighted? 
I think it, it captures all of them. What we were able to do was obviously um, also based on our kind of practical experience of, of the kind of um, inquiries that were coming to us from council services of, of challenges they face, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic. So we were aware of the kind of the areas where business processes were changing. We were also quite heavily involved in the, the business grant process. So again, we were able to pull on our practical experience and then take the Audit Scotland report to provide some assurance that there was an alignment there as to what we were finding practically um, with what the Audit Scotland report um, was pulling out. So um, in my opinion, I think that captures the main fraud risk and that's been the basis of the work that we've now planned for the second six months of the year. Um, and I think it certainly it, it would it would provide significant assurance to the committee once that work's been completed around um, how controls have been maintained and strengthened throughout the pandemic. Lovely. Okay. And thanks, Chair. Thanks, Yvonne. Thank you. Uh, Julia, so your hand is raised. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I was wondering whether the, obviously COVID has changed working, working practices significantly and that the way that people are working whilst it is agile and, and nimble and, and very beneficial may come with additional risks and risks not normally associated with their role in which case the council's insurance may or may not be valid. Um, it also may result in, in fraud, whether um, as a result of that, that uh, those new activities are, is, are the risk assessments in place and is that considered in the key messages? We have worked quite closely with our colleagues in risk management and insurance um, around producing bulletins um, and that has taken um, um, cognizance of, of what the cover is within insurance policy. So we've been quite clear with employees as to, to what council insurance um, would cover. So um, I, I think the work is there. Um, in terms of the actual report, there's further detail within the report. Um, the key messages um, doesn't replicate all of the detail that's in within the report line by line. Um, but I think there's very much an awareness of the point that you're making um, and it's something that we're picking up with our colleagues around um, looking at the top risk, the extent to which um, they change during the period. And one of the other pieces of work that we've planned in the second half of the year is looking at the revised control. So that's basically going through all of our top risks, all of the control cars attached to it, picking out all of the areas where we've had to put revised controls in place, testing those and assessing whether they're fit for purpose. So it's quite a significant piece of work as well that's planned in that area. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask something? In terms of the so the COVID risks that have come up, um, you say in some ways that they're not really new risks, they're just, you know, old risks writ large. I'm just wondering whether there have been any changes in come out of that. Uh, well, I think practically remote working has necessitated a change in procedure, so it's, it's required us to rethink what the, the key control is and how we put that in place in remote working. So a very basic example, of if there was a form before that had to be signed by two people, um, because that provided the segregation of duties and authorisation ahead of something happening. Um, a very basic way of working around that now is that that sits electronically in an email trail. So there is ways of actually having the same control. It just looks a wee bit different. And that's what a lot of the work that we've been doing has been based on principles like that, is stripping it back as to what it is we're trying to achieve and having to think of another way of, of doing it. But definitely the, the working arrangements um, has necessitated that um, review. But I don't think in any way we've compromised our controls. I think in all cases, what we've tried to do is think um, how we can now do this and a recognition of the fact that we may have to work differently going forward. So um, that, that's all very much been, been built into any re revision, not to weaken the controls, just to change the way in which they're applied. OK, lovely. Um, and uh, Grant, you have your hand up. Hi. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good uh, thing to discuss the, with, in terms of increased risk. Um, that's uh, something I'm, you know, keenly aware of. Um, Cyber security is such a big issue at the moment because obviously, we, as you know, we have people now working from home. Um, um, and I think um, with that, the training, um, the awareness training um, must, you know, 
you know mirror that, match that uh, demand, and it has to get. Um, um, the training has to be robust because the measures that criminals are taking to um, commit cyber attacks are becoming more sophisticated. Um, so it's a you know it's a point of interest for me. It's um, it's something I'm keenly aware of. Um, that vulnerabilities are you know consistently they have to be patched almost daily. Okay, it's, it's the, the the threat is so acute at this point in time. Um, and and it's I, I would like to see um, in terms of the data provided or um, and the information that's been provided to us with regards to cyber security, um, uh, COVID linked uh, changes to practice. Um, it's a little bit more data to you know offer the you know the council that assurance that um, that, that, that we really are taking this, the, the the cyber threats seriously, um, not just now, but also um, how those threats are developing into the future as well. Um, I agree that's a, a very significant risk and it, it's one that we are aware of. Uh, the Chief Internal Auditors Group in Scotland is currently devising a programme um, with the support of the Scottish Government and uh, um, and other bodies um, as to as to what you know a, a program of internal audit work in cyber security would look like. So it is very much a, a, a live issue and one that we're aware that work will need to be undertaken and are planning to do that. Um, and I think you'll see that as an element of the 22-23 plan that should hopefully come to you in, in January. You okay with that, Grant? Yes, that's absolutely fine. I'm happy um, to take that on board. Um, it would be really good to see the the process. Um, you know, you know what's involved in the process. Um, it was great to that we have this the, the audit, but I think um, the the amount of detail that we receive as a council um, that we're privy to should be commensurate with the level of threat um, that that I think we that I think we face. Okay. Thank you very much. Any uh, any more questions? You didn't get off so lightly this time, Yvonne, but there we are. Thank you very much. Um, this is a paper for noting, so I move that we note it. Can I have a seconder, please? Anyone? I'll second that, Eric. Thank you, Julia. Eric. And if we are happy with that, then let's move on to item number seven, Audit Scotland, Local Government in Scotland Overview 2021. And we have Tom Little to talk to this. Thanks, Chair, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, th this report starts on page 111 of your papers, and it provides uh, a summary of the Audit Scotland report, Local Government in Scotland Overview 2021. Now, this is an annual report um, that covers key areas of local government activity and it offers an opinion on how we would um, face challenges uh, that lie ahead of us and any issues. Now, as such, I'd make the point it covers all of the local authority sector in Scotland. It's not specific to South Lanarkshire Council. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that the report notes that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, created some unprecedented issues and challenges for councils, not just for us, but also for our partners and the communities that we work with. So the report goes on to summarise what Audit Scotland have said uh, and does that across several sections, which includes some of the key uh, areas that the report covers. And these are communities and people, service delivery and partnership working. There's a case study focusing on planning and also a section on resources and governance. So I'll take these in turn. Uh, there's under Section 5, Communities and People, you'll see a number of key messages and lessons learned um, noted there. And I'll just pick out some of them. Uh, they include the fact, again, not a surprise to you, that councils have been at the centre of the response to the pandemic and that relationships with our communities have been vital in terms of that response. Also that um, the impact of COVID-19 has been particularly acute on some vulnerable people in sections of, of society and that the recovery from the pandemic will involve us and others making sure that tackling inequalities is a priority going forward. Section six covers um, service delivery and partnership working and again some some highlights if you like. Uh, the, the report 
comments that councils were agile in terms of adapting service provision during the pandemic, uh, and they say that will have to continue later in the report. They also say there'll be a, a need for staff to remain agile in terms of accommodating those changes that have happened already and will, will lie ahead. And also that um, councils will have to closely monitor the impact of any service disruption and changes that um, continue to occur and that affect our people in our communities. Moving on to section seven, that will be 113 in your papers. Um, this gets us to resources and governance. And again, there are some key points that are laid out for you there and the various bullet points. Um, key one probably being that councils continue to face financial challenges um, and that these have been exacerbated by the pandemic. The bullet points that I have to make, um, a number of points around the, the nature of funding that's been provided to councils, including that councils are likely to require additional support to address the challenges that, that lie ahead. Now, move on to section uh, eight. This um, The report ends with some general conclusions. And again, none of these will take you very much by surprise, given what we've all been through in the last 20 months or so. But there's a recognition in there, you'll see 8.1, that a uh, return to business as usual will not be possible and that the negative impacts of the pandemic are expected to be felt for many years to come. That's a quick summary of the report. Um, the recommendations are simply to note the contents, uh, the key messages and recommendations that Audit Scotland have given us. Happy to take any questions, of course. Thank you, Tom. Have we any questions? We've all got all the questions, it looks like. No, all I would say, actually, in response to this report is that um, there have been times when I've criticised various things that have happened over the last year, but overall, I think the council has um, coped very well, and the, the agility, I think that was a word that was mentioned in there, seems to have been um, to the fore. Uh, now, we do have a question. Mary? Uh, it's just an, an observation, Eric, on 5.1. I think the just to reiterate what Tom was saying. And I think the community has risen, you know, to the table uh, and dealt with the pandemic in a way that we probably all never really thought they would um, and responded in a way that was absolutely to be commendable. Um, and I can only commend the communities that did help out. Um, and it has shown the inequalities within our communities and a lot of work for us as councillors going forward and how we help with uh, trying to fill that gap uh, with the inequalities. Okay, thank you. And Walter? Yeah, thanks Chair. Again, I'd like to say I think the council have done an incredibly marvellous job under extremely difficult circumstances. But uh, I guess little projects like this that there's lessons to be learned and uh, you know, good things that we've done versus the things that we could have done better on. And I'm just wondering if those are going to be captured anywhere. Tom, do you like to come back to that? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I should maybe have said it out. So the, this report also went to the Performance um, and Review Scrutiny Forum. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an important report, this annual report, especially this year. And so we took it to both um, the committee and the forum. But also the individual aspects that are that are relate to South Lancashire Council will be getting picked up in various reports that go to the, the resource committees going forward. Uh, as I said, I, I guess I could summarise this by saying the report that I've just presented to you didn't give us any surprises, I don't think, but it was very useful in terms of underlining um, what we knew already and making the case for the sector as a whole in terms of what we need perhaps to go forward from here. And I would expect that to be reflected in a number of different reports coming before councillors in, in the months and years to come. OK. Are you happy with that, Walter? Yeah, I guess as we'll, we'll see it in the future then. Thank you. We'll keep our eyes open. Thank you very much. If there are no more questions, then I will move that we note this paper. Can I have a second there, please? Yeah, I'll second oh. it. Thank you, Walter. Sorry, OK. Jeremy. So we can move on to uh, the next item, item eight, which is the forward programme for future meetings. And I'll hand over to Elizabeth Ann. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, this report starts on page uh, 117 of your papers, and it's a standard report which is brought to every risk and audit scrutiny committee. The purpose of the report is set out in uh, paragraph 1.1, and it's to advise members of the forward programme for meetings of the committee. And um, for this current cycle, it is up to January 2022. And also to invite members to suggest topics for inclusion. So the uh, forward plan uh, for the next meeting is given in the appendix, which is on page 119 of your papers. And the recommendation is um, that the forward programme uh, be noted. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Elizabeth. And do we have any questions? Or any suggestions for inclusion? Either now or you can come to me at any point if you want to um, want us to cover anything. No questions? No hands, Chair. Okie doke. In that case, I move that we note this report. Can I have a seconder, please? I'll second it. Oh, thank you, Jared. Um, okay, so if, we've agree if, we, if we're all in agreement with that, we can move on to item nine, which is urgent business, but I have no urgent business for you. So I will um, bring this meeting to a close and thank you all for your attendance, particularly those from outside who have come along to join us today. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, Chair. Yep, thanks, Chair. Thanks, all. Bye.